morning. I would like to welcome you all this morning. If you haven't found a seat, feel free to just quickly find one. I wanted to open us this morning with a psalm. Well, not a whole one, just part of one. Psalm 146, verses 1 and 2 read, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Father God, we just thank you that we can come this morning and praise you. Help us to praise you with all our soul as long as we live. We pray these things in your name. Amen. I would like to say I'm going to welcome the Cummings for music, but it's the Cummings plus extras that we're very thankful to have. So please join us as we worship this morning. I'm happy to have them too. Is this on? Hello? So um, I'm supposed to invite you to stand and sing with us. If you'd like to do that. Um, this is uh, Christmas. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult for people. I know I've been there. But you know, we're called to praise him. And we have that hope that came in that manger on uh, Christmas that we celebrate. And that gives us our hope in order to, you know, continue day to day. So um, if you can find it uh, in your soul to worship him in spirit and truth, whether you're sitting or you're standing, just do that. But I would invite you to take that plunge and just stand. And sing with us, please.
Thank you.
Father God, we just thank you that the good news has come. Noel, we look forward to your coming again. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, worship team. So as mentioned last week, we find ourselves in the Advent season. We are now in the, this is technically the last Sunday of Advent. And Advent is considered a time of waiting. What are we waiting for? I think all of our lives are marked with waiting. We're waiting for the weekend. We're waiting for our next birthday, to get our first job, for a promotion, a child to be born a grandchild, of retirement, we're always waiting. But what are we waiting for in this Advent season so close to Christmas? I read two, two separate phrases this week um, that are similar to each other. The first read, a secret seed is rich with promised fruit. A secret seed is rich with promised fruit. So everything that that plant needs to produce that fruit is in that tiny little seed. And the second is very similar to it in that for seeds are buried when it's time to grow. For seeds are buried when it's time to grow. We don't plant seeds um, right now because it's too far from the spring, but we plant them right when we're ready for them to grow. In James 5, verses 7 to 8, it says, Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. This left me with some questions that I want to leave with each of you for this week. Um, what does it mean for us to wait for the coming of the Lord? And what does it mean to slow down and be patient? What will we achieve by doing that as we wait for the coming of the Lord? Remember that God has planted in the garden of your life seeds that are already ready to grow, seeds that um, have the full potential for whatever it is he wants to accomplish in you. So as you wait on the Lord to come again, think about what you're doing to tend that garden where he has planted those seeds full of potential at the very right time to grow. Let me pray into that for us this morning. Father, it's so easy for, for us to just want to sit and wait and see what you're doing. But you've already planted seeds in our lives of things that you want us to do and accomplish and that you will grow at the time that you feel is perfect. So as we wait for your son's return and we wrestle with what it is that you've called us to do, I pray that you would... Make us mindful about the garden of our life and the seeds that, that already have the full potential of what you want them to grow into. Help us to lean into you, the perfect gardener. We ask these things in your very holy name. Amen. We have a few announcements this morning. I can show a few slides. Um, again, we're just reminding everyone of our COVID things to continue. Social distance, wear a mask. Next one. Teen Talk. There is a Teen Talk this Tuesday. Um, there is not a Friday youth because that's Christmas Eve. I think that's self-explanatory. <laughs> and then please keep an eye on the youth uh, Facebook page and youth messenger chat group um, because there will be upcoming announcements about Christmas, or not Christmas, New Year's Eve, and then other youth to follow after that. Uh, Wednesday morning, coffee and prayer time. I, 
Uh, it's not at the church. <laughs> it's uh, with Vivian, and you can join in online. And if you need more information about that, please talk to me afterwards, and I'll tell you how you can connect in with that Wednesday group. Um, and then, of course, uh, Eve of Christmas Eve, December 23rd, here at 7 o'clock. All are welcome. Yep, and that just leads us into our prayer time. I do have a few prayer requests already. So we are going to continue to pray for Celine and Neil as they continue uh, to deal with cancer. So we will continue to lift them up as they go through that. And we, we want to continue to pray for Steve, who has ongoing wounds on his ankles that we are continuing to pray for healing, and the McCallums that are all in the Congo at this time. We would pray for them. At this time, are there any other prayer requests or praise items? Faith Ann. Okay. All right. We had a, a little bit of a communion. Communic I can't even talk. Communication issue there. Um, Brett uh, is sharing that Faith Ann had a prayer request for herself, and that's as much as the request is. So we will lift up Faith Ann in prayer this morning. Oh. <laughs> She's not feeling as. <laughs> She's had a touch. It's all good. Anyway. Okay then I will just move to a, a time of prayer for all of us. Father God, I just thank you that we can bring all our requests before you. We can freely come into your presence. We lift up Celine and Neil to you, Lord. Pray for strength for each of them. Pray for peace in their heart. I pray that they would feel your closeness at this time. And most of all, Lord, we pray for healing in their bodies. We lift up Steve, who deals with ongoing healing in his ankles from wounds, and pray for complete healing. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, the pain is uh, not, not bad at this point, but we pray that it would stay that way and that uh, he would have, as I asked, complete healing from that, Lord. We thank you for the McCallums. We thank you that they were able to travel to the Congo. We just pray for this time that they are away. Um, and we look forward, Father, to hearing the stories when they come home. Bless their time there, I pray. Father God, I want to pray for Jordan this morning, who is about to bring the word that you've placed on his heart. Thank you, Lord, for his willingness to serve. Thank you for the words that you've placed in his heart. I pray that you would give the rest of us uh, ears to hear and hearts willing to to move on what is shared with us this morning. I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Time for the kids to go to Sunday school now. Yeah. <clears throat> so today, I want to answer or ask and answer the question Who is Jesus? We'll be uh, celebrating his uh, birth in this coming week. And uh, we'll be celebrating uh, by giving presents uh, to each other as a symbol of, of God's free gift to us. Uh, and Paul writes in Romans, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this question, who is Jesus? It's, it's a very important question. If you ask that question, you'll find that 
there's a hundred different opinions. Everyone has an opinion on who Jesus is. It's because that the person of Jesus, who he really is, determines if someone's religion or worldview is correct. Is he the Messiah? Is he God, as the Bible says? Or is he just a wise teacher? There are many other religions. Uh, I've talked to a few on uh, campus. Uh, the Muslims, they have a high view of Jesus. They believe that he was a prophet sent to the children of Israel. Uh, some of them believe that Jesus was sinless. Uh, he was a miracle worker. Uh, he did miracles uh, through uh, Allah, they say. But they say he is not God. They say he is not the son of God, definitely not. And he didn't die on the cross. Rather, he was raised before and somebody else took his place. Those are central issues to Christianity. You may have uh, spoken to Mormons. Uh, they believe that, well, you might talk to them. They might, you might go away from the conversation thinking that they believe exactly the same as we do. They use the same words. But they more, they're more of a polytheistic religion. They believe that God himself is just like a human like you and me. He achieved Godhood through obedience. Jesus is like you and me. He achieved Godhood through obedience. And we can do the same and achieve Godhood very different Jesus than the one that is taught in the Bible. Jehovah Witnesses, they might have come to your doorstep. They teach that Jesus was Michael the Archangel, and that he came, he was born as Jesus. When he died, he stayed dead. But he was raised spiritually, but the, the person Jesus remained dead. And now he's again resumed the identity of Michael the Archangel. And then there's other religions, uh, well, atheism, Hinduism, in Buddhism, they all teach in some form or manner that maybe Jesus existed. If he existed, then he was a, a good teacher, a good person. Uh, but definitely, he wasn't God or the Son of God as he claimed to be. So today, I want to go and dig into who Jesus himself claimed to be and what he used as his authority. And we'll find that he used the scriptures as his authority for the foundation of like, who he is. The Bible outlines in very great detail who the Messiah had to be and what he had to do in order to be called the Messiah. And this was done through the prophecy found in the scriptures. So he's, when God describes who the Messiah had to be, he didn't do it after the fact. Oh, this, this is the person, this is who the Messiah had to be. No, he did it before the fact. Hundreds and sometimes thousands of years, he said, this is who the Messiah had to be. This is who, you, who to expect, who to have hope in. And yeah, so the Bible has extensive prophecies that have been fulfilled, many through Jesus. And we'll be going over a few today, uh, mostly, or uh, just a few that have been fulfilled in the Nativity story. Uh, so yeah, we'll be going over a few passages, so if you have pen, maybe write them down or re-watch re the live stream so that uh, you can read them on your own time. So I hope by the end of this, you'll have a greater appreciation and understanding of who we are celebrating the birth of this Christmas. So the first, we'll cover a few points of who Jesus claimed to be. Jesus first claimed to be our salvation. I have uh, five statements that Jesus made, five I am statements from the Gospel of John. So John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John 10, 7 and 9, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters through me will be saved. In John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And finally, John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's, that's a lot to unpack. He, Jesus claims a lot about himself. This is just five uh, statements that he makes. But basically, he's been saying that if you believe in Jesus, if you believe in him, you will be saved even though you die. And not only that, he's exclusive. That, his exclusivity means that all the other religions, all the other viewpoints can't be right. Another thing that Jesus claims to be is that he claims to be God. In John 8, 58, he uh, has a dialogue with the Jewish people, the, the Pharisees. 
And in this verse, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So if, if, if usually, uh, usually Muslims or Jehovah's Witnesses will try to point, like, oh, Jesus never said, there's never a point where Jesus said, I am God. Well, you can just show them this verse, John 8, 58. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now that's the title that God declared to Moses in the burning bush, I am that I am. And uh, what he, uh, in Isaiah 43, uh, God's talking through the prophet Isaiah, he says, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that you may be- know and believe me and understand that I am he. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the I am he is the same words that Jesus used, I am. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. So that's what Isaiah, the, uh, the Lord was speaking through Isaiah, and that's what Jesus was claiming himself to be. Jesus also claimed to be the Messiah. We'll pick this up in Matthew 16, and verses 13 to 17. Uh, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And that's a term referring to himself. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And Jesus asked them, well, what do you say, or who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. Christ is the Greek term for Messiah. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now a little bit later, we'll go into who the Jews expected the Messiah to be by looking through prophecy. Um, but for now, we know that Jesus claimed, this is, these are not the only uh, exclusive claims of Jesus, but these are three claims that he claimed to be the only way for salvation, he claimed to be God, and he claimed to be the Messiah. Now, what, what was the foundation, what was the authority that Jesus used to establish his, who he was? And to determine that, I want to look at Luke 24, and we'll read verses 13 to 27. Here, this is after Jesus had died, three days after he had already resurrected, but uh, the, the, the disciples didn't know this yet. So uh, we'll start from verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find the body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found that it was just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Later in the same chapter, Jesus appears to his disciples. And he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So here we see he's not uh, doing miracles this time. He's just using scripture to establish his authority. He looked at what the law of Moses 
the prophets and the Psalms had to say concerning the Messiah. Everything that they said had to come true. According to Jesus, the scriptures cannot be broken. If God said something happened, then it happened. If God says something will happen, then it will happen. Just as the scriptures have said it. So now we're going to go over uh, some of these prophecies. Now, the, the first thing to understand about uh, looking at Old Testament prophecies is that there's kind of like a duality. There's a two types of prophecies. There's one that talks about the suffering Messiah, suffering servant, and the other one that talks about the king, a reigning king. Now, this causes a dilemma, uh, especially for early, early Jewish rabbis before Jesus. According to Arnold Schuchtenbaum, to, in order to reconcile this, they proposed that perhaps there would be two messiahs, one that would fulfill both, uh, both prof- types of prophecies. But now, of course, we have the Old Testament, we have uh, Jesus explaining things. We know that there's going to be one messiah coming twice. And this sort of duality still causes a problem for people today. It's still a stumbling block. Uh, Maimonides, he was a, a Jewish rabbi a, about a thousand years after Jesus, and he believed that the Messiah had to accomplish the king prophecies. He basically, there's, he laid out four things. The Messiah had to restore the kingdom of David to its former glory, achieve victory in battle against Israel's enemies, he had to rebuild the temple, and gather the exiles to the land of Israel. He got this from reading the Old Testament prophecies. He expected the Messiah to redeem Israel. And just when we read in Luke, that's what the first century Jewish people had expected too, that they expected the the Messiah to redeem Israel. However, when uh, confronted with that, Jesus pointed to them the passages that needed to be fulfilled first, which were the suffering, suffering servant passages that deal with his first coming. He needed to suffer and to die, to pay for our sins, before he could come back as a reigning king, as he was prophesied to be. So now we're going to dig into some of these prophecies, just a few, and uh, we're going to read uh, the prophecy, and then we're going to see how in the Nativity story uh, he fulfilled this. The first uh, prophecy I want to look over is the lineage of the Messiah. Now, there's many passages throughout uh, the Old Testament that talk about the lineage of the Messiah. There's uh, predictions that the Messiah will be through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Judah, and then Jesse and David. So Jesse is the David's father. We're not going to go through all of them. We're just going to look at two. And I want to look at the, the prophecies regarding that God gave to Abraham and that God gave to David. So the first one is in Genesis 22, verse 18. Here God is talking to Abraham, reiterating the promise that God made to Abraham that uh, he will have many descendants. And then God says in verse 18, And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. All, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This promise re- was reiterated through Jacob, Isaac, and Jacob as well. So there's a sort of, somehow, in some way, their descendants will bless the entire wor- uh, earth, all the nations. Fast forward a thousand years and many other prophecies. Uh, now, God is talking to David, and God's making a covenant with David. And uh, we'll pick this up in 2 Samuel, uh, verse, or chapter 11, uh, the second part of uh, 11 to uh, verse 13. So through the prophet Nathan, God is talking to, to David here. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are finished and you lie down with your father, I will raise up your descendants after you, who will come from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So here, this is just one of many passages that talk about the Messiah coming from the line of David. Here, God is promising that a descendant of David will sit on the throne forever. That touches a little bit about the king Messiah prophecy, but we know that the Messiah had to be one that came from the line of David. Now this promise was actually further reiterated by the angel Gabriel to Mary, confirming that the Messiah, Jesus, will be the one to fulfill this prophecy. So let's read the beginning of the nativity story found in Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 1, and then we'll read from verses 26 to 33. Now in the sixth month, 
the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. This prophecy, this, the, 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 prophecy uh, the fulfillment of this prophecy is further uh, solidified in the genealogies found in Matthew and in Luke. If you read them, if you compare them side by side, you'll actually find that they differ uh, quite a bit after David. And the reason for this is that Matthew's genealogy follows Joseph's lineage, and Luke's genealogy follows Mary's lineage. So Jesus fulfilled this prophecy through both parents. The next prophecy that Jesus fulfilled in, the, in the, his birth is the uniqueness of his birth. Isaiah predicts this one. Uh, so Isaiah was writing at a time of destruction in Israel. If you recall, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were split. And this time, the Assyrians were conquering the northern kingdom and taking them into captivity. So God is talking through Isaiah about a future Messiah, a future hope that they have in this Messiah. And so we can pick this up uh, in Isaiah 7, uh, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So here Isaiah explains that this Messiah or future Redeemer is to be born of the Virgin. And this was written about 700 years before Jesus was born. Let's pick up the nativity story in Matthew 2 and see the fulfillment of this. So Matthew 2, we'll start in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The next prophecy that Jesus fulfilled through his birth would be the location of the Messiah's birth. Micah writes at about the, the prophet Micah writes at about the same time as the prophet Isaiah, and so God is giving a future hope in this Messiah to the nation of Israel. And in Micah 5.2, God predicts where the Messiah will be born. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. But, for, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, from you will come this ruler, this ruler which uh, will come from the line of David. This is another prophecy that was fulfilled by Jesus through circumstances completely outside of his earthly control. Let's see its fulfillment in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went on their way on their, to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. 
to wrap them in cloths and place them in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. The final prophecy that Jesus, well, that we'll look at that Jesus fulfilled in his birth would be the, will be the nature of the Messiah, his deity. After Isaiah talks about the Messiah being born of a virgin in chapter 7, he describes who this child Emmanuel will be. I will pick up the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now this is the classic uh, verse that we read uh, during Christmas time. For unto us a child is born. Ironically, it deals a lot with the second coming and that the, the government will be on his shoulders and he will reign with a time of peace and righteousness. But I want to focus on one of the titles that he is predicted to have. And that title is Mighty God. Nobody can be called Mighty God. Nobody can have that God, that title other than God. Micah also uh, predicted the, the deity of Jesus, or the Messiah. Uh, the, the verse that we, wrote, uh, that we read before, Micah 5.2. So it said, it predicted where Jesus would be born, Bethlehem. It predicted that this person would be ruler in Israel. But it, and it also predicted that this, his coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Ancient of days. That's the title for God that is found in the book of Daniel. So the Old Testament prophesied that this Savior will be God. Let's finish the nativity story by reading Luke 2, verses 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. In this passage, we read the title that the angels said who the baby Jesus was. They called him the Messiah, the Lord. John MacArthur states that the Greek word for Lord in this passage, while it can be master, it is also used to translate the covenant name for God. Here, as in most of its New Testament usages, it is a title for deity. Jesus is God. I want to end with one more prophecy, but this one will be fulfilled by, was fulfilled by Jesus about 33 years later. We've looked at prophecies regarding Jesus' lineage, his birthplace, he was born of a virgin, and his deity. But now we'll be looking at a prophecy regarding his death. Now there's many prophecies regarding his death. And David, about a thousand years before, wrote of a suffering very similar to that of the Roman crucifixion. There are prophecies regarding the amount of money Jesus would be betrayed by. There are prophecies concerning the timing of his death to the year. We don't have a time to go over all of them, but it's very interesting. 
I just want to read the, the classic example, I guess, of the suffering servant. And this is found in Isaiah 53. We'll only read verses 46, but I encourage you to uh, read this in your Bible after uh, church. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Jesus was born to fulfill this prophecy and many others like it. Jesus was born to die. Isaiah goes on to say that because of the Messiah's righteousness and his death, many will be able to be called righteous as well. This describes a prediction of the new covenant that God made with Israel, a covenant that will bless all the nations. If we have faith in Jesus, then we have eternal life. And this is a blessing that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that through them all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This is the Messiah. So he was one from the line of David. He was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. He is God, and he died for us. So that through faith, all the nations of the world would be blessed. So that we might live eternally with him. This is the person we're celebrating the birth of this coming week. I hope that uh, this encouraged you this, Christ this Christmas season. Uh, you have many passages to look on and ponder with your family and friends. I hope that this talk has strengthened your faith in Jesus the Messiah, or perhaps challenged your view on Jesus. Thank you. Let us pray. <laughs> hmm. Lord, we just thank you for coming down to us so that even though while we were still sinners, you died for us. That is your love for us, and we thank you forever for this. I pray that uh, you... Help us to live uh, through your word. You light our path for us this coming week and that uh, we can fulfill the work that you've prepared for us so that we can be the salt of the earth uh, that you have called us to be. We thank you that you are forever and you want to be with us wherever we go to the ends of the earth. Thank you. Amen. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. So thank you everybody that wrote cards. Some got dropped off this week. Some people baked cookies. Some people made crafts for each other. It was overwhelming. And um, we've just brought in all the, all the bags and they're in the hall. So what I would invite you to do is stop over there and take your bag home. And if you see a bag of someone who's not here today, and you live relatively close to their home, we would love for you to do a little drop-off delivery. And uh, otherwise, we will do a lot of drop-off deliveries. So a little, a little load spread out over all of us would be wonderful. And again, just to remind you, the purpose of this has been just to mutually encourage each other. Some people are online, and we don't get to see you in person. And then there was a season where we were doing A and B and we didn't all see each other and now we're still behind masks so we don't exactly get to see each other in the same way. So we just wanted to coordinate something with the, the Congregational Care Committee, put up this initiative and it's been so amazing to see all the things you guys have written to each other and I didn't open the cards, just 
thing that you've written to each other. Um, if by chance there isn't something for you, we've missed you, you're brand new, you've only been coming for a week or two, we'd love to know that. And it's a strange thing in these times where to, to know who exactly our congregation is is hard because you may be online, so you can um, drop us a message in the YouTube video or just come and see one of us. Come see, I think, me, Jennifer, Cheryl, Dave, or Susan are the people who are on the Congregational Care Committee, and we'd, we'd love to make sure to include your contact information if you aren't getting the announcements that come out from Shelley. We just want to make more of an effort to keep people connected in. So this is just a very small effort. Thanks to all of you for what you've done. So pop over there and make sure you take some things home today, and uh, bless you all, and Merry Christmas. <laughs>